The knowledge or knowing, which is at the start or immediately our object, cannot be anything else but immediate knowledge itself. A knowledge of the immediate or what simply is. Our approach to the object must also be immediate or receptive. We must alter nothing in the object as it presents itself. In apprehending it, we must refrain from trying to comprehend it. We now begin the main body of the phenomenology of spirit, looking at this section called sense certainty. And why are we beginning there? Well, like I put here, shouldn't we begin at the beginning? This is the question that Hegel is posing for us. If we have gone through all of this sort of conceptual preparation in the preface and the introduction, and we arrived at the point where we realize that we need to be doing phenomenology, we need to allow things to present themselves to us, things that have already occurred, but which matter to us as, as subjects that can relive them, we need to have a kind of hands-off, passive attitude. And what kind of objects make the most sense for doing this? Why not begin with what seems to be most basic, the objects of sense, the things that we perceive? And this is where, indeed, um, much phenomenology begins with, thinking about a red ball or a green ball, a la Husserl. But as Hegel's going to reveal to us, we're not really beginning at the beginning because we never actually have a beginning to start from. It always turns out that this immediacy that we think that we have conceals the fact that there's mediation going on and we will get to an end where everything has been connected together and all the mediations have been unveiled, but we have to actually start from somewhere. So instead of saying beginning, if you, if you want to quibble about this, we can call it a starting point, we commence the process. And the representation that we make to ourselves of what we're doing at the beginning is that consciousness has to be purely receptive. It, it takes in the object. As, as Hegel says, um, the knowledge that, that um, we're beginning with is immediate knowledge. That is, knowledge that doesn't have anything standing in the way. And you might even say, in a certain respect, I'm, I'm already confusing things by showing this arrow here. What we really want to have is the object just right smack up against consciousness, presenting itself to it, and through the, the you know, the, now be careful, the medium of the senses. But think about what it's like when we're in the moment, when we're just paying attention to what's going on, when we feel that we are being just purely receptive. There's no distance. There's no filter between us and the world that we're experiencing. That is something that's quite attractive. So Hegel says this is what we are going to begin with. It's going to turn out that that's not, a, you know, it's not measuring up to its own pretensions. The object presents itself to us as immediate. Nothing between us and it. Nothing intervening. Nothing filtering. Nothing conditioning it. As what simply is. Being. This is our raw, immediate, in-your-face encounter with beings as such. That's what's being presented here. And consciousness, then, has some jobs to do. Not only does it have to be purely receptive, it has to take care not to alter anything, not to bring too much of itself to the experience, to let the experience impinge upon, us, upon it, not to allow the experience to be conditioned or put into a framework by consciousness. So as Hegel will say, um, the translation here is a little bit a little bit tricky. Um, what we want to do is not allow comprehension to stand in the place of apprehension. We want to distance those from each other. Comprehension here, the understanding in that sense, is begreifen, this conceptual knowledge that we've been talking about for so long. And what we want instead is a raw, pure, unadulterated, aufassen, just grabbing on to the thing itself, seizing hold of it. 
there's a little bit of you know trickery here because the hyphen you know to to grab to grip fasten to, to to grab onto as well both ways we can we can make sense of this but the idea is that we as consciousness have a capacity for taking in what is coming to us from the object what is coming to us through our senses the experience that we take in Because of its concrete content, sense certainty immediately appears as the richest kind of knowledge. Indeed, a knowledge of infinite wealth for which no bounds can be found, either when we reach out into space and time in which it is dispersed, or when we take a bit of this wealth and by division enter into it. Moreover, sense certainty appears to be the truest knowledge, for it is not as yet emitted anything from the object, but the, it has the object before it in its perfect entirety. But in the event, this very certainty proves itself to be the most abstract and poorest truth. All that it says about what it knows is just that it is. And its truth contains nothing but the sheer being of the thing. Consciousness, for its part, is, is in this certainty only a pure I, or I am in it only as a pure this, and the object similarly only as a pure this. I, this particular I, am certain of this particular thing, not because I, qua consciousness, in knowing it, have developed myself or thought about it in various ways, and also not because the thing of which I am certain in virtue of a host of distinct qualities would be in its own self a rich complex of connections or related in various ways to other things. Neither of these has anything to do with the truth of sense certainty. Here, neither I nor the thing has the significance of a complex process of mediation. The I does not have the significance of a manifold imagining or thinking, nor does the thing signify something that has a host of qualities. On the contrary, the thing is, and it is merely because it is. It is, this is the essential point for self, for sense knowledge, and this pure being or simple immediacy constitutes its truth. Similarly, certainty as a connection is an immediate pure connection. Consciousness is I, nothing more, a pure this. The singular consciousness knows a pure this or the single item. It doesn't take long for Hegel to start already engaging in some dialectical transformations where you thought things were this way and they turn out to be this way. And in section 91, this is going to occur really in, in two important ways. So we begin from this conception, as he says, of sense certainty as being exactly what we were looking for. It's the richest kind of knowledge, and it's the truest kind of knowledge. Let's look at how he makes that case, or rather doesn't make the case, but allows sense certainty itself and the way it works to make the case for it. So why is it the richest kind of knowledge? Well, the consciousness is relating itself to these objects, and the objects are impinging upon consciousness. And it can turn to any one of them that it wants to. He says that it's rich in that there's almost an infinity of possibilities as we range through space and time. Think about your, your sensible manifold as you're looking around. You know, I'm looking around in a room and there are who knows how many thousand books in this room, each of which has its spine, some color, and I can range my eyes over any single one of them as I'm moving from object to object to object, or if I look at a spot on the chalkboard. Space and time offer me this infinite variety of spectacles to, to engage in. And even better, if I take any one given object and I sort of unpack it and look at it very closely, I can see more and more and more in it. I can take a piece of chalk like this that originally I just see as a, a tiny cylinder, and I notice that the bevels on it are at different angles. If I start paying attention to what I'm doing, um, they do these, these sort of things in mindfulness exercises. I'm not going to do this, but I mean, you can take this piece of chalk and stick it in your mouth as well and start, you know, 
experiencing it by taste. I won't do that because I did that as a kid uh, and I found out I don't like chalk. Um, and you could let it linger. You know, they, they do this in mindfulness exercises quite often with food with a raisin. First, you're supposed to like touch it to your lip and then you like put it on your tongue and now you like let it linger and then you bite into it and you get the juicy, you know, sweetness of it. Well, okay, that's what he's talking about is an infinite variety. And this is all concrete. So this is why it's so rich. Concrete as opposed to the abstract, as opposed to the general. You want to see what, you know, chalk, the hardness of chalk feels like? Squeeze a little bit in your hand. Or, you know, rub a bit on your finger and feel the dryness of it. You know, listen to the sound that it makes. That's all concrete. That's all coming to us through our senses. So he says, um, because of its content, this is, is the richest kind of knowledge. A knowledge of infinite wealth for which no bounds can be found. You know, space and time, we can move around as much as we want in them. Time, you can say, all right, I'm going to stop perceiving right now. Ain't going to happen. I suppose if you, you know, gouged your eyes up, but even then your brain's going to be having some sort of sensory impressions of blankness or whatever it is that you see when you're not seeing anything. So he says, um, we, can buy, we can take a bit of this wealth and by division enter into it. That's what we're talking about is like looking at an object, you know, look at your hand. Notice the ink spots that I must have like touch the, the pen to myself, I can look at the various colors, you know, and he's actually right. When we look at objects and we look at them carefully, they reveal all sorts of things to us that we didn't originally think were there, that we didn't really see. That's why when you're doing art, it's so important to be a good spectator, to really see what's there. If I'm going to draw my hand, I need to look at where shadows actually fall, not just where I think they fall, but where they actually do fall on the object that I'm perceiving. So it's the richest kind of knowledge. That's great. It's also the truest kind of knowledge. Why? Because it's not intervening. It's not taking anything from consciousness and imposing it on the object. It's not making objects line up with each other and compare against each other. It's not bringing any filters, any preconceptions, any structures to the object. It's just letting the experience happen. Letting the sensory data flow over one so that you can just see what's there. So far, it sounds so pretty good. But Hegel's going to say, well, that's not actually what's going on. Because he says, in the, in the event, the very certainty proves itself to be the most abstract and porous truth. All that it says about what it knows is just that it is. So what we're getting with these objects is not really an object per se, but just being. Just something that is. Because what does it mean for something to truly be an object? It means that it has qualities, a whole bunch of qualities. And we're going to see why this matters in a moment. Um, and it also means that it relates itself to other objects, that it finds itself in a matrix with them, that it connects itself with them that it's not just something totally independent and on its own. For consciousness to experience that is for consciousness to experience an object as an object. He says, um, consciousness would, would perceive things as a batch of qualities, a rich complex of connections related in various ways to other things. So this isn't happening in sense certainty. Instead, consciousness is just being confronted with the raw being, what is, what, what lies in front of it, what impinges upon it. And consciousness reveals itself to us as being what Hegel calls the pure I. Because if it's just going to be receptive like that, 
it can't bring anything of itself. And at least insofar as it is receptive for the person who's doing the perceiving, the person who's conscious, the only thing that matters is this, you know, you might say ability to mirror what is out there, this capacity to take in what's coming in from the outside and make that be what it is. So it can't have any qualities itself. It can't have any determinacy itself. It says, consciousness is in this certainty only a pure I, or I am in it. Here's where it gets really interesting. Only as a pure this. You can't even really call it an I, because that's already to ascribe it some sort of properties, some qualities, isn't it? This. That's all we got, is this. Now that's not very rich, is it? That's pretty abstract. And it's not even giving us the truth of, say, consciousness, or the person, or the subject, or the truth of the object, or the truth of the relationship between them. It's just giving us this relationship between one this and another this. It's not telling us an awful lot anymore, is it? So here's where the dialectical transformation has taken place. As we follow out what is actually entailed in sense certainty, in the operation of experience this way, he says, um, this, this particular I, I am certain of this particular thing. Not because I, qua consciousness, and knowing it, have developed myself, or thought about it in various ways, that can't be going on if I want to stay in the moment, if I don't want to get away from this pure certainty that sense uh, is able to give me. As soon as I start thinking about it, I've lost it. I'm no longer in sense certainty. I may have a relationship to the object, and it may be a richer, truer relationship, but it's no longer the one of sense certainty. He says, um, in, in knowing it, I have developed myself or thought about it in various ways, and also not because the thing of which I am certain would be in itself a rich complex of connections. Neither of these has anything to do with the truth of sense certainty. So sense certainty turns out to be something that we don't actually experience, it might be said to be rather imaginary. Because what we do experience is my thinking about things, or your thinking about things, as a determinate being, in determinate ways, over time, within space, in terms of something more than just this and this. This doesn't tell me anything, does it? So he says, on the contrary, the thing is, and it is merely because it is, it is, this is the essential point for sense knowledge, and this pure being, or simple immediacy, constitutes its truth. So the truth of sense certainty is not the fact that sense certainty is actually giving us an unmediated relation. The truth of sense certainty is rather that it's the poorest form of knowledge, that it's only a beginning point, that it can only yield us this is in some sort of relation to each other that has yet to, to be determined in any significant concrete way. It's not really the co most concrete form of knowledge. It's actually the most abstract. So he says, consciousness is I, nothing more a pure this. The singular consciousness knows a pure this or the single item. So you notice what we're doing now. We're actually sort of closing in on consciousness as a this being related now to another this. And the entire universe is kind of closing in upon this, upon these two thises as all that's really happening. But when we look carefully at this pure being which constitutes the essence of this certainty in which this certainty pronounces to be its truth, we see that much more is involved. An actual sense certainty is not merely this pure immediacy, but an instance of it. Among the countless differences cropping up here, we find in every case that the crucial one is that in sense certainty, pure being at once splits up into what we have called the two thises. 
one this as I and the other this as object. When we reflect upon this difference, we find that neither one nor the other is only immediately present in sense certainty, but each is at the same time mediated. I have this certainty through something else, that is the thing, and it similarly is in sense certainty through something else, that is, through the I. Hegel is making three important points, engaging in three important transitions, or showing us three important realizations, one right after another, in this rather short passage, section 92. There's a lot that's, that's packed in here. And if, if we want to sort of trace it in an outline, we're going from a discussion of sense certainty to a contrast between essence and example, and then a splitting between two different thises, and then we're, look, we're tackling the, the issue of immediacy or, or mediation. So let's look at what's going on here, since this is actually a, a pretty crucial point for what's happening with sense certainty. Sense certainty presents itself as if it's providing us with the pure being of things, the pure being in experience, and doing so in a way that's completely immediate. And Hegel talks now about the relation between essence and example. Now, the word essence, vasen, we can understand it in the, the classic sense of essence as sort of what is happening in, in all um, instances or particulars or examples, what it is that connects them all together, but also it's, it's connected with the notion of, of you know, being itself. And Here's where it gets really interesting. So when we're talking about sense certainty and we're thinking about it as such, does sense certainty really have an essence? Think about that for a moment. Try to imagine for yourself a case where you are just completely there in the moment, a passive, receptive observer of everything that's going on. Maybe you're people watching, you're just taking in the people in the crowd, and you're not really thinking, you're not trying to figure out anything about them, you're just taking it all in. Or you're at a concert, and you're just listening to the band and watching the spectacle. Or you've managed to, you know, do some mindfulness training, and you're sitting down at a meal, and instead of thinking about the day, or, you know, about what's, gonna, what's the next course, you're just like totally there for the food, and the wine, or the beer, or whatever you're drinking. Now, have you captured the essence of sense certainty? No. What you've done with any of those examples is precisely discuss an example. Any metaphor that we can use, whether it's of, you know, the mind is mirror or still waters or anything like that, is not an essence but just an example of what the passivity or the receptivity of sense certainty would be like, the immediacy of it. You know, when you're in that, that zone, okay, we can use words like zone, and we can talk about that experience, but here's the thing. It's sense certainty. Sense certainty is always going to be a matter of determinate experiences, except when we're thinking about sense certainty, when we're talking about it, when we're making it an object of our own thought. Then we can do this kind of abstraction, can't we, and talk about, yeah, man, you just need to be in the moment. Just need to experience. Just don't put any of yourself into it. Just let the objects talk to you. That's all rather abstract. So he says, when we look at this, that's supposed to be in essence, what we really get is a bunch of examples. We see that more is involved. An actual sense certainty, any example that we want to think of, is an example, an instance in this text, right? Beispiel in German. A particular uh, thing that we can wrap our, our heads around or our, our senses around. So he says, among the countless differences cropping up, we find in every case that the crucial one is that, in sense certainty, pure being, this pure immediacy, splits up into two things. 
the I on one side, who's supposed to be experiencing passively, taking things in, could be a pure I, and then the object, another this. And you can say, well, they're, they're really both the same because they're both thises. We don't even know that about them. We're not that far along in our, in our investigation. But we have a splitting that's taking place, a separation. When somebody is supposed to be there just in the moment experiencing, if it's them that's there just experiencing, then it's not so you know pure and immediate as we assumed that it was, and we can distinguish two different poles to it, two different sides to it. So he says, the, there's the this is I and the other this is object. And then when we begin to reflect on that difference, so not, not just being in the situation, but reflecting on what's going on there, we see that it's not really immediate, as we thought it was. Notice that I put immediacy versus not mediacy, but mediation. An actual mediation that's taking place. Interestingly, and this is sort of a side note too, immediacy can only be immediacy in relation to, by means of the verses, mediation, which means that there's actually a mediation going on between immediacy and mediation, which means that in a Hegelian standpoint, immediacy, anytime that you see immediacy coming up, expect that that's not going to last very long. There always is going to be some sort of mediation because you don't get pure immediacy. It's just not there. Not when we analyze it, not when we pay attention to what's really going on. So, what do we find out? Well, we go back to the this I and the this object, and he says when we reflect on this difference, we find out that neither one nor the other is only immediately present in sense certainty. That's not what's really happening in sense certainty. In sense certainty, this object is what it is because of the mediation of the this I. Likewise, the this I is what it is, able to take in the this object, able to be receptive, because of another mediation going on. Both of them are mediating each other. They're existing in what we call a relation. So it was actually mistaken to think that we had some sort of pure being that coupled the two of them together and a face difference, they fused into each other somehow. He says, um, neither one nor the other is immediately present. Each is at the same time mediated. I have this certainty, I have sense certainty through something else. I'm able to have this, what seems to me, immediate experience because something else is offering that to me. If I'm eating a, a piece of chocolate and I say, well, this is an immediate experience, I'm just tasting chocolate now, and tasting all these different, you know, things built into the thing, you know, maybe it's milk chocolate or dark chocolate or has a little bit of orange or mint in it, who knows? I'm doing so through the actual thing. That's what's providing me with that experience. I'm not just sort of making it up inside my head. I'm having it through something else. That's not me. But the experience is occurring in me, in my consciousness. And the thing is only able to be the thing that it is and to give the possibility of, you know, the, the, those impressions to, to impinge that certainty because I'm letting it do so. Because I'm perceiving it. Because I am involved in it. So he says, um, I have this certainty through something else, the thing. It is in self-certainty only through the I. So now we need to look a little bit more carefully at what's really going on here. It is not just we who make this distinction between essence and instance, between immediacy and mediation. On the contrary, we find it within sense certainty itself, and it is not. It is to be taken up in the form in which it is present there, not as we have just defined it. 
One of the terms is posited in sense certainty in the form of a simple immediate being, or as the essence, the object. The other, however, is posited as what is unessential and mediated, something which in sense certainty is not in itself, but through the mediation of an other, the I, a knowing which knows the object only because the object is. While the knowing may either be or not be, but the object is, it is what is true, or it is the essence. It is regardless of whether it is known or not, and it remains even if it is not known, whereas there is no knowledge if the object is not there. In section 93, Hegel might actually appear to be going back on what he just told us in section 92. But what he's doing is he's, he's backing up a little bit and saying, let's go about this and let's see where the, the object of our, our investigation leads us. We know now that we're going to find all sorts of mediations happening, but let's see what sense, sense uh, certainty can reveal to us when we analyze it. So he says, it's not just we, in section 92, who make this distinction between essence and example or instance, immediacy and mediation. We find it within sense certainty itself. So if we're paying close attention to what actually goes on within sense certainty, what it's, what it's requiring, what it's involving, then we're going to see this same, these same distinctions. He says, it's not to be taken up in the, in the, it's to be taken up in the form in which it's present there, not as we have just defined it. So we're backing off from what we did in 92, and now we're going to see how things are going on in sense certainty. So sense certainty posits, as he says, the object or the, the being as something simple, something immediate, and as something essential, as what's really going on there, as what really matters. And it's breaking up the process or the dyadic connection of sense perception into something else that then cast off as not really being essential. As, as he says, not being immediate, only existing for something else, not in itself, but existing because of an other. And the other is the sense experience. So without, he's saying, without some sort of sense experience going on, no I. This is interesting, because normally we think about it, well, I have sense experiences, and, you know, I'm the one who's really calling the shots, because I'm the one who, like, turns around and looks at stuff, and it's my eyeballs or my tongue or my skin that's taking that in. If I wasn't here, there's nothing to perceive. But sense certainty, the way that it presents itself to us at the beginning is saying, no, there's all sorts of things in the world, and whether you're there to perceive them or not, that's not really that important. This is where the real stuff is going on. You're just the one who happens to be along for the epistemological ride. You're the one who gets to take in the things. But what you're taking in is coming from what actually is, what is true. So he'll go on and he'll say, um, this term is, is posited as, as, you know, simple immediate being, as the essence. So the I is related to the, the object through knowing. But that knowing is purely contingent. It doesn't have to happen for the object to be the object for this to already be in existence. He says the knowing knows the object only because the object is. It is what is true or it is the essence. It is regardless of whether it's known or not. So if knowing doesn't take place, that's fine as far as the object is concerned. It doesn't need the knower, the I, the person, to be knowing the object. If a waterfall is there and it's, it's flowing, it's flowing whether we actually go and perceive it or not. You know, um, From this point of view, if the tree falls in the forest, does it make any noise? Yeah, it makes noise. It just doesn't have anyone there to perceive it. There is the possibility of perception whether somebody is actually perceiving it or not, whether somebody is knowing it or not.
So he says, it remains even if it's not known. Whereas if the object's not there, there is no knowledge of the object because there's nothing to know. 